Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would really like to welcome you to this Grüntal Symposium, which we have at lunchtime, uh, which is entitled Chronic Pain All the Same. Uh, my name is Ralf Baron. I'm a neurologist from Kiel in Germany. And uh, I think this is a very interesting uh, symposium which we can offer during the lunchtime. So it will address several aspects of uh, neuropathic pain conditions, several conditions, neuropathic conditions, sen central sensitization, and other mechanisms. And uh, in addition to myself, we have uh, several other speakers today. Um, the first speaker is uh, Professor Anthony Dickinson from the U University College London, and he will talk a little bit about the basic science behind uh, chronicity and neuropathic components. Uh, then we have Professor Lars Arndt Nielsen here from Aalborg in Denmark. He is addressing the problem of sensitization in osteoarthritis uh, patients. And then uh, it's a very great pleasure that Andrew Moore is coming again. He gave a wonderful talk yesterday and he will discuss with us some data on tapentadol in osteoarthritis and in back pain. And myself, I will give you an overview of some new data uh, on neuropathic pain in back pain patients. So we decided to have a, a question and answer around just after this is, uh, the talks. So there will be uh, cards, question cards available during the talks and you might fill them out and they will be collected and we will have them here uh, at the podium and then we will discuss this at the end of the symposium. So, uh, without further delay, I would like to call the first speaker to the podium, which is, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. Tony Dickinson from University College London. Tony, please come to the podium. Good afternoon, everybody. So, the um, title of my talk, um, which is about to come up um, any moment now, is somewhat controversial. Can chronic pain be reversed? And this is obviously a, a hugely important question. But it's a question which I think we can start to think about answering, I don't think we have the answer yet, by combining and translating from preclinical work on mechanisms to key research on, on patients and trying to kind of put the two areas together so we can start to think about chronic pain, what the mechanisms are, and whether we can do something um, about it. And so these are my conflicts of interest, they're, they're relatively modest. But we move on to key types of pain. Because as I think you all know, it's important to think about the origins of the pain. We have nociceptive pain in blue. This is tissue damage. This is a chemical activation of nociceptive endings in an intact nervous system. And the best example of this would be classical osteoarthritis. On the right-hand side, we have neuropathic pain, and as it says there, a lesion or a disease of the peripheral or the central nervous system. There, the issue is damage to neural structures, and so the substrates are the ion channels that are altered within those nerves. So already, if we're thinking about preventing chronic pain, if it's a nociceptive pain, we're going to have to start off in the periphery with non-steroidals and steroids, with the neuropathic pain, we need to be thinking about ion channel modulating drugs, such as the, the sodium channel blockers and drugs like gabapentin and pregabalin. And this becomes more complicated in the center because if we have mixed pains and low back pain, cancer pain, and now we're starting to think that even osteoarthritis, these pains that have elements of both nociceptive and neuropathic pain are going to need dual treatments in terms of preventing the periphery. So if we go to osteoarthritis, this so-called sort of classical inflammatory condition, at the top on the left, you can see this sort of normal um, situation within the joint. The osteoarthritis starts to alter and we move to the um, damaged joint. And then in the early stages, at least, we have inflammatory components. This can lead to central sensitization. And you must never think that central sensitization has got something to do with neuropathic pain. It hasn't. It's a component of many pains. Nociceptive, as Lars Arendt Neeson will be, be showing you, neuropathic, and many other pain conditions as well. 
But those processes can, in a patient, produce possibly, and Professor Baron and myself and one of my very talented students wrote this recent review, suggesting that from both preclinical and clinical data, there may be neuropathic components to osteoarthritis. And so these could be the patients who, when you replace the joint, the hip or the knee, you remove the damaged tissue, if their pain doesn't go away, it may well be they have neuropathic components that we're not altering. So trying to target the source is a problem. It's not as easy as we think. And we have peripheral events in pain. Those inevitably have to transmit through into the spinal cord. And so thinking about what the spinal cord is subject to and central sensitization within the spinal cord is a key event in terms of the changing of a pain from an acute to a chronic one. The spinal cord amplifies pain, that's what central sensitization is, and in turn, the descending controls, which I've put up as traffic signals, the red or stop messages, the green or go, descending controls can excite or inhibit spinal activity, and so the messages going into the cortex, the sensory component of pain, the messages going into the limbic brain, the emotional affective components, and probably the comorbidities are generated there, are subject to alteration in terms of spinal events. And the spinal cord itself is altered by descending pathways. So if the spinal cord is important and it's subject to descending controls, we need to be thinking about trying to translate basic science through to the patient in terms of some of the risk factors. And we know that, for example, failure of descending inhibitions that I'll talk about later, but also the presence of central sensitization are key risk factors for chronicity within groups of patients, suggesting that as time goes on, there are multiple changes within the nervous system and we need to deal with these. So maybe one way to think about this is to say, we'll leave the periphery for now, but we'll try and restore normal central modulation, put the balance back between excitation and inhibition, and maybe that might get us somewhere to reversing chronicity. But wind-up and temporal summation are key events. And this is the neuronal basis. This is wind-up. This is work in animals. But there is plenty of evidence from humans suggesting that temporal summation, central sensitization are easily observable in, as I said, many patient groups. In red, those neuronal responses, that is what the periphery tells the spinal cord. In blue, that's what wind up adds on to those messages. So a pain score of two from the periphery could be switched to eight by this spinal event. The area of pain increases, and if the peripheral input is small, the brain message could be large, so we have to believe our patients independently of radiological findings, for example, but also, as it says in the box, it can predict chronic pain after surgery. So these messages have to go up to the higher centers of the brain, and these green painful inputs into the limbic areas, like the amygdala, project through to the periaqueductal gray, the locus aurelius, and this rostroventral medial medulla. These are brainstem areas that inevitably project back to the spinal cord. So it allows the top of the nervous system to talk back to the bottom, the spinal cord. There are on and off cells in these areas. The off cells inhibit pain, the on cells enhance it. And in terms of the pharmacology, in red, noradrenaline is a key inhibitory transmitter acting on its alpha-2 adrenoceptor. 5-HT can have mixed effects, but one of the roles of 5-HT is the opposite of noradrenaline. It indeed facilitates painful messages. This was an entire rodent anatomy until imaging in humans now reveals that if we look in the midbrain and the brainstem, we see the exact comparable anatomical area. So we'd be confident that these circuits are present and we know they're altered in uh, patients. So this balance between excitation and inhibition shifts. The descending inhibitions through noradrenaline are protective. 
5-HT is a mixture, the red stop message for 5-HT must be the tryptans in migraine and headaches, but in many other parts of the body, 5-HT is facilitatory through two spinal cord receptors, you can see at the bottom right, the 5-HT2 and 3 receptors. And so as we move from an acute condition to a persistent pain state, the inhibitions reduce, the facilitations increase, and it's a bit like having bad cop, good cop sitting in your brain. Good cop has less influence as your pain becomes chronic. Bad cop, the excitatory enhancements of pain start to dominate. So these noradrenergic protective signals are of enormous importance. And their pathways, as I said, from the brain back to the spinal cord. The noradrenaline is released in the spinal cord, but the pathways originate up in the brain. So we have, on the left-hand side, incoming pain fibers releasing transmitter, and the release of noradrenaline will activate that alpha-2 adrenoceptor and inhibit messages coming in from those peripheral fibers. But there are opiate receptors on the spinal cord neurons, and they will also inhibit activity. So this is how noradrenaline protects against pain. It's very obviously this alpha-2 adrenoceptor. And there's one very clever way to enhance these pathways, which is to simply increase the levels of noradrenaline through a noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor, which will produce more noradrenaline in the synapse, more inhibitions. And the protective role of noradrenaline has been shown very beautifully by work by Frank Parecker and his group, where in the middle you can see the normal animal, a balance between excitation and inhibition. And this study shows that following, in this case, a peripheral neuropathy, that mechanical hypersensitivity develops, just like patients with allodynias and punctate hyperalgesia. On the left-hand side, most animals show this, but there are animals on the right-hand side where half of them have protected themselves against that peripheral insult. They don't have a peripheral hypersensitivity because they've brought into play a descending inhibition. So this noradrenaline pathway brings me on to tepentadol, which, of course, as you know, has two mechanisms of action. It's a mu opioid receptor agonist, and it's a noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor. And it reduces the effects of central sensitization, but it's effective preclinically in models of inflammatory, as you can see, neuropathic, and mixed pain animal models. And one important point is that the opioid load of this molecule is reduced compared to a pure opioid because of this noradrenergic mechanism that's inherent, intrinsic within the molecule. And at the bottom, the evidence suggests that this could be effective, this central modulation against many pain conditions. So how do we know that there's an opioid action? How do we know there's a noradrenaline action? At the top, acute pain, we can use antagonists. And naloxone reverses the effects of tepentadol, but also in blue, an alpha-2 antagonist. But it would appear there's maybe more mu action acutely. But at the bottom, when we go into um, a model, in this case of um, spinal nerve ligation, neuropathy, the dominant action of the drug is the noradrenergic component. And the proof of the importance of this noradrenaline action is seen if we look in animals that have no mu opioid receptors. What you can see here is morphine in red failing to work. Thank goodness, as a pharmacologist, no receptor it can't work. On the right-hand side, tepentatol retains its action. And this is in acute pain. But more dramatically, in a model of diabetic neuropathy, on the, on the right-hand side, you can very clearly see that, again, morphine doesn't work. But without any new potential, the receptor's not there, tepentadol in yellow retains much of its activity. So how can we look at these descending pathways? A very long time ago, so, such a long time ago when I started my career, that the only way you can see the paper is to get your phone out and take a picture of it. There are no PDFs. 
but we showed that you could induce activity in spinal cord neurons, as you can see here, from the hind paw, and apply a second painful stimulus to the tail, to the nose, to the viscera. One pain would inhibit another. And the human counterpart of this is conditioned pain modulation. And you may say, well, why bother with one pain inhibiting another? The reason is that the ability of one pain to reduce a second pain relies on descending inhibitions. These are a marker of intrinsic pain modulation. And in the normal healthy population, and you can test yourselves um, at the end of this symposium, you should be able to produce the 30-40% of one pain by another. But if you have surgery and you have a low condition pain modulation, low descending inhibitions, you are more likely to have a chronic pain following um, that surgical procedure. So it's important in chronicity. And when we look in many, many pain conditions, and I'm not going to bother reading the list, you can see that almost universally in cl clinical pain conditions, there is a reduction in this descending inhibition. So we have a marker in animals and patients for descending inhibition. And we've gone back and looked at this, and on the left-hand side, you have the classical Renaissance picture from uh, the Loire Valley. One sister apparently is pregnant, so maybe it's an obstetric pain control. On the right, the kind of East London counterpart. But we've gone back to look at one pain against another, and in normal conditions, we generate, following some control responses of neurons, inhibition. When we go into a model of neuropathy, we lose that descending inhibition. One pain no longer inhibits another, and you can see in the middle, it's ipsilateral, and on the, the far right, it's contralateral. This is a universal loss of descending inhibition. So we went and looked at the pharmacology of this. And in normal conditions, we produce DNIC on these neurons. If we block that noradrenaline alpha-2 adrenoceptor, the second blue column, there is no DNIC, no condition pain modulation. It's noradrenaline. We go into nerve injury. The sham animals have an ability to one pain to inhibit another. After nerve injury, that's gone. And on the right, we give to pentadol and it restores that descending inhibition. So preclinically, we can clearly say that that MOR, NRI action of tepentadol brings back a descending inhibitory pathway, and we know that inhibitory pathway protects against pain. So we have these dual actions of the molecule, and I just wanted to point out that at the spinal cord level, we can reduce central sensitization, as well as I've shown you, restore descending inhibition as well. So these two key points for chronic pain, loss of descending inhibition, it's brought back, central sensitization is reduced. And there are really key clinical counterparts to this, and this is now translating backwards from the clinic to the animals, because on the left-hand side, David Yarnitsky has published you can predict the action of duloxetine by the presence of conditioned pain modulation. If you have a good descending inhibition, that drug doesn't work because it's working on something that's already there. But on the right, weak or absent descending inhibition, duloxetine is effective. And of course, it's an SNRI. And on the right, to pentadol. In patients now with diabetic neuropathy, work by Albert Dahan shows a restoration from the loss in blue, in pink on the right. In patients, it's brought back as well. And most importantly, if you look at the right-hand side, as we bring back this conditioned pain modulation in patients, so their pain scores reduce. So restoring normal central modulation brings pain down. So the summary then would be that if we can't fix the source, we can modulate the pain, and we can change activity in many parts of the nervous system by focusing on spinal modulation. The risk factors we can restore pharmacologically with agents that work on central sensitization and noradrenaline, and this restoration of normal modulation, I think, might be starting to tell us that we might be able to start thinking about changing chronic pain. So I would like to thank my group and Kirsty Bannister in particular, who's done much of this work. 
Thank you all for coming along, and thank you to Grunenthal for bringing us together. Thank you.